Hi, welcome to James Miller Lifeology, where you learn to simplify and transform your spirit, mind, and body. My name is James Miller. I'm a licensed psychotherapist and a composer. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Let's get started. Did you know that on jamesmillerlifeology.com, you can enroll in the academy I created for listeners just like you? I've created courses you may take at your own pace, which will help you simplify and transform your spirit, mind, and body. Enroll in one of the classes today. I have a great show for you today. I'm going to help you discover self-compassion. I'll also be interviewing Miriam Webster, who shares her incredible story of discovering self-compassion and how that was instrumental in helping her recover from being paralyzed for 10 years. For more information about Miriam, please visit everywomanchanges.com. I have some exciting news. Did you know that I'm on the radio three times a week? You may hear me on this same station on Tuesdays at 1.30 p.m., Fridays at 9.30 a.m., and Saturdays at 12.30 p.m. You may also hear me on iHeartRadio, as well as on all the other major podcasting platforms, such as iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and many others. Simply search for the show name, James Miller Lifeology. You all know me as a psychotherapist, but some of you may not yet know me as a composer. I currently have two albums which have been released. Think of both albums like books. Each original composition is written like a chapter in a book. The first album, Consolation, explores a character's grief and loss. And just like in any book, the story explores a character's heartache and eventually he finds healing and hope. The second album, Restoration, explores a character's personal development. He has an awakening, and in that awakening, he recognizes all the things in his life which aren't healthy, and it helps him come to a place of restoration, being restored to something greater than before. You may purchase both albums on iTunes or any other digital music store. The names of the albums are Consolation and Restoration, and my stage name is James S. Miller. The name of the piece you are currently hearing is from the second album, Restoration, entitled Introspection. Having self-compassion. The majority of us, when we would see someone on the street or someone who's in need, we would help them. Or let's say you have a friend who's struggling with something, you would give that person the best advice you could. One of the most difficult things is to give yourself compassion, to give yourself love. When we grow up, as a child, we often allow the world to dictate our value. And that's very normal because we're children and we don't yet have life experience. As we grow up, circumstances will continue to validate whatever we originally thought as a child. And then as we become an adult, that core belief is then solidified, and that's who we are. You'll often realize what you really think about yourself when you do something silly or or make a mistake of some sort. Whatever that self-talk is within your head, in other words, what are the thoughts you have, determines what you really think about yourself. Often, when we do make a mistake, we will say really negative things about ourselves, and we'll often not feel very good about ourselves. And unfortunately, we can all be very mean to ourselves. When you think of a team, a team is only as strong as its weakest link. So as you're trying to grow and develop and to become a more evolved person, if there's a part of you that continues to berate yourself, that continues to belittle yourself or call yourself names, that's as far and as fast as you're going to grow. It is very vital to counteract those negative thoughts, but not only that, but to treat yourself in a loving, compassionate way. Often we think that's just simply words that we say to ourselves. But let's think about this even more. When you overeat, that hurts you. When you oversleep, that starts to have your muscles atrophy. When you sit and watch TV all day, you're telling yourself you're not worthy of learning something new. All the actions that we do determines our value. And once again, there's nothing wrong with doing some of these things. But when we go on autopilot, we often allow those negative core beliefs to determine our value and how compassionate we are towards ourselves. I would really encourage you to really be aware of what your thoughts are as you go throughout your day. When you look in the mirror and you're wearing something that you don't necessarily like, what do you say about yourself? What do you say about your body? Or you make a mistake at work. What do you say to yourself? When you look at the actions you engage in each day, are those actions that shows yourself compassion? Another way to think of that is if you told somebody to do what you're doing, would that come across as compassionate? Would that come across as loving? And if you realize that it probably isn't, then I'd really ask yourself, why are you doing that to yourself? You are with yourself all the time. So why would you not love yourself? Why would you not give yourself compassion? When you give yourself compassion and give yourself a break when you're kind to yourself, that is going to help you grow and develop in an exponential way. So remember, the kinder, more gentle, more compassionate you are to yourself, the more fulfilled your life will be. 
a quick example of one of the courses you'll find in the academy entitled When All Hell Breaks Loose. <laughs> We've all experienced those times when nothing seems to go right. This class will specifically train you how to process the event, regroup, and use what was thought as a stumbling block and turn it into a stepping stone. Enroll in the class today. Personal transformation expert Miriam Webster is a popular San Francisco Bay Area inspirational speaker and author. She regained her mobility from nearly a decade as a paraplegic and turned a 30-year psychology and marketing career into a joyous new business. Her new business, Every Woman Changes, empowers mission-driven women entrepreneurs with a healing and helping focus to be the change they want to see in the world by permanently transforming their inner limitations and creating profitable movements for social good. Welcome to my show, Miriam. Thank you so much for having me, James. Yes, I'm so excited to talk to you. You know, you were actually referred to me by another one of my friends, Don Hutchison, who has a phenomenal podcast. So I'm really looking forward for you to guest on my show as well. Awesome. Let's go. Yeah. So you have done so many amazing things. But this, today, I specifically wanted to focus on your own life and all the, all the things that you've overcome to create this dynamic woman in front of me today. Okay. So you are also a psychotherapist as well, correct? Yep, I was. Well, actually, that was only half of my career. Okay. I double majored in uh, clinical and counseling psychology, which is the personal psychotherapist part. Mm -hmm. And then also industrial psychology, which is the psychology of marketing. Yes. And I worked with uh, corporations in I'm in, based in Silicon Valley. And I worked with corporations like Yahoo and Cisco that you probably heard of. Yeah. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, do consumers like the red button or the blue button? And, you know, why would you buy this widget and so on and so forth? And or, you know, online services, the yes. case may be. Okay. And did you find that you were fulfilled with those those two careers? Heck no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the transfer personal transformation expert now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I was my own best and first client. Oh really? <laughs> that is so funny. How did you even get into both of those worlds? Well, it's interesting because uh, in college, and I'm from Columbia, Missouri, uh -huh. and in college, I, I went to school in town because we have a choice of three universities in town, so there was no reason to go outside of town, my yeah. parents didn't. Um, and I was basically just not finding my passion, and I had a boyfriend who was an engineer, and he said, you ought to become an engineer. This was in the early 80s. He said, computer engineering is going to become really hot. And you ought to do that. Now, I'm a math dunce. I mm. don't have a piece where, in the brain where the numbers go. I just don't have it. So I tried that for a year, and I completely crapped out. It was, it was horrible, a horrible year. But what I was attracted to, I, I went to the counseling center on campus for counseling because that's where everyone said you should go next. And I was fascinated by how they helped people. Mm. And I realized that in the dorm, I was the person everyone came to with a problem. Oh, interesting. So I thought, you know, geez, I'm good at this. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should get some training and do this because sure. it, it really lit me up to do that. And helping people, that lights me up. Working in corporate, not so much. Sure, exactly. Well, it's interesting that you, uh, you, were in one direction as far as going to be the engineering major and then you needed counseling perhaps because of your self-esteem and realizing that this wasn't for you and then all of a sudden that, that led you into something different so i always like to tell people like a closed door is really an opportunity for something bigger and better to come into your life and that's what happened and then as your life continually mapped itself out other closed doors happened which caused you to be this phenomenal woman in front of me <laughs> yeah <laughs> a lot <Yeah>. of closed doors. <laughs> but you know, I think that's the thing. It's all about the reframe. A closed door is not necessarily a negative thing. It's just like sometimes the divine or God or whomever you want to say um, moves us and morphs us in a direction because sometimes we just don't see it. And so those closed doors are really an opportunity for us to grow and develop in an amazing way. Right. And I have a piece of advice for people who are facing closed doors right now and uh -huh. they're stressing out about it or grieving the closed door is bless and release. Mm. So the, you know, when I, um, I got thrown over by a boyfriend in college and I was mourning the relationship, a very wise person said to me, you need to bless that person yes. for giving you the gift of not suffering through a relationship where you were not loved properly. Mm. 
and then release them to their own best and highest good. And that will bring your best and highest good faster. Yes, that's amazing. It's funny that you say that because, uh, so I have a YouTube channel as well. And I probably, I don't know, maybe about a month ago, I actually did a, an episode on there called The Gift of Goodbye. Uh, yeah. That gift, it's a beautiful gift of that person when they walked mm-hmm. out of your life. It's such a phenomenal thing because now mm-hmm. it opens up this amazing space for us to grow and develop in a way that we probably couldn't have had that person not left us in, in, right. in that and time. Right, and for the right person to come along. Yes, exactly. Because you, if you hold on to someone that's still in your life that was never really meant to be in your life for, for however long, well, then you haven't created that space for that person to come in. And so if, if you can't create a space, you know, you think of a, a glass of water, if it's full of water, well, you can't add any more water to it. So you have to remove things. And so I think that gift of goodbye, in other words, is that way of saying, now I can release this. Now there's an opportunity for me to have something different in my life. Exactly. That's, that's yeah. beautiful. Now, we were talking in the, um, the virtual green room <laughs> about that you were living in, in London and you had a pretty traumatic experience. It was Cambridge, actually. Cambridge, oh, Cambridge England. So, I, lived, okay, yeah. I lived in both London and Cambridge, though. Uh-huh. But uh, the, I was a social worker for the blind. Uh, the British didn't know what to make of my degree. C- clinical and counseling psychology at that point in time in the um, mid-80s did not exist. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Uh, and so I was, you know, they wanted to find me a job. I wanted to find a job. And they said, well, you'd be a great social worker because you've got good training. So I was a social worker for the blind. And that was a trip all on its own. That was really cool. But I was out on my rounds going around a roundabout one day in the rain, pouring rain as usual, and a drunk on a motorcycle. I was, I was in a Mini Cooper oh van, gosh, yeah. which came up to my chest height. <laughs> no, <laughs> a mini, no mini, floor, yeah. <laughs> no floor under the driver's feet. We had a piece of cardboard. Uh, but we had bought this van from a uh, plumber, and it had a heavy box of pipe wrenches in the back. And this drunk on the motorcycle came up over the little flower mound in the center, crashed down into the back of my car, and that box of pipe wrenches swacked me in the back. Oh, my gosh. And broke my back. And I didn't know it at the time because I had just run over a woman on a moped and I thought, oh, shoot, I've killed this woman. Oh, my gosh, (laughs) Miriam. I boiled out of the car, you know, just I was frantic trying to, you know, help her. And she came up swinging and swearing. So I knew she was okay. And then at that moment, it kind of hit me. Oh, shoot, I'm hurt. Oh, my gosh. And I sank to the concrete and then my life changed forever because I became um, a paraplegic. I was progressively paralyzed from the waist down. Oh, my gosh. And it took me nine years to regain my mobility. Doctors said I would never, ever walk again. And I, I always tell people this. If, if they ever tell you a never or, or shouldn't or you'll, you, you can't, the best answer is your middle finger. <laughs> they, they have no idea yeah. of the power inside of us yes. to change. Yes. That, and that, that will, that, that tenacity, that will, that, that inner drive, it's such a visceral power, if you will, that can really launch us and do something that perhaps even modern science or just anyone, any one of that, that's not really for us, that they, they don't realize the potential within us, you know? And so that, that, that power that can really, it, it really is visceral. It really comes out in such a profound way. It really does. And I have to also credit my mother and she's gone now, but she was the most amazing inspiration to me simply because she just nagged living crap out of me every day. She called me on the phone. She's like, honey, I know you can do it. You're so smart. And you create all those healing processes for people. I know you can do this for yourself and just didn't quit. She didn't let up. And it was like the phone would ring and I would go, oh my God, no, I can't, I can't face her. I can't, I can't, but I would pick the phone up and she really did hold the space for excellence. That's amazing. You have one person in your life that holds that space for you. Yes. Then value them. Yes. And I think there's a beautiful um, advice that you give there because there is that one person. And just like you said, when you felt like, oh my God, I can't hear this again. Or if I hear this one more time, but that is such a beautiful gift that they're giving you because eventually you will start to believe it. Eventually that will become, you will become that person for yourself. But until then you have to have that person that can help you through that. Yes. And this is actually a really crucial point. I'd like to expand on just a moment, if I may. Yeah, please. Um, the, what I've come to call what mom was doing was keeping an evolutionary environment open. Mm -hmm. So I create my entire life right now. uh, That's one lesson I took away from this is as an evolutionary environment for myself. I don't, uh, um, complacency has no place in my life. Mm -hmm. 
And I always want to be in continual evolution because I don't think you're done until you're in the box, you know? I agree. (laughs) A flourishing finish, yeah. (laughs) Right. So so keep keep evolving. And how can I keep evolving? Well, I don't place things within easy reach. You know, I put Mm -hmm. them across the across the room on a table, so I have to get up and walk over there. So I get a little exercise, you know, just as a very simple example. Sure. But that whole evolutionary environment piece was what kept me going. And I started out with just trying to wiggle one pinky toe. And I finally got after about a year and a half, it took me a year and a half just to wiggle one toe. And then it went faster than that after then. But it it just was persistence, Mm -hmm. persistence. And do not believe those around you who tell you, you can't, you will never. Create that evolutionary environment, create your entire life as an evolutionary environment for yourself, both spiritually, physically, you know, mentally, in all ways. I love it. I love it. That's wonderful advice. Only hang out with those people who believe in you. Don't hang out with the naysayers. You are are worth so much more. Yes. Yes. I love it. Yes. That's great. Well, I wanted to ask you, and that was one of the questions I was going to ask you is, how did you do it in the sense of... To go 10 years, I mean, that is obviously a very long time. I can't even imagine what it would be like to not be mobile for 10 years. And for you to sit there and to fight that, was there ever a time, and I would imagine there is uh, many, many times, that you're like, forget it, this is too hard. I can't do this. I don't want to do this. My life is going to be this way. Did you ever have those, those thoughts or that, that perception? Every damn day. <laughs> mm, I bet. Oh, my gosh, man, my bet. Yeah. Um, uh, up until a point. Mm-hmm. Up until a point where... Like I had begun to move both of my feet and there was uh, the, the numbness. It was like if you've ever laid on your arm in bed and it mm-hmm. went all um, pins and needles, it was like that, that pins and needles feeling for about a year, which was just maddening. It was mm. thoroughly maddening. But the, the numbness retreating and the paralysis retreating from, went from my toes on up my body. So I would gain a little more. And I was lurching around. So I went from having a walker to, um, to two crutches to two canes to one cane to none. Mm, it's amazing. And as that progression happened, I gained a little bit of hope, a little bit of faith, a little bit of, of joy. As, as it went along. And then it, like you mentioned, you know, having that one person, I clung to my mother's faith in me until I could develop that faith in myself. Yes. Because I saw the change happening. And sometimes it's like, you're, we're told, go on faith, go on faith. And it's like, that's all well and good. But when it goes into years and years and years. Mm-hmm. No, <laughs> exactly. Know? And that's what I'm saying. 10 years. That's, that's a crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, show me the money, show me, show me a dime at mm-hmm. least, crying out loud, <laughs> freaking yeah. dime, come on. And I got that dime. So that just caused me to hope and work harder. When you had the, your first um, pinky toe, when it moved, what, what did you experience right then? A disbelief. I bet. I was like, okay, that didn't happen. Oh my gosh. I, I'm just hoping so hard that I, I made that up. Um, but I felt almost immediately there was a pain that I didn't feel, I couldn't feel before mm. in, my, in my toe and the muscles around that toe. So I knew something had happened. And so I tried to make it happen again. And it was several hours before I could actually make it happen again. But I did. And then I, I think I screamed out loud. I'm not oh quite gosh, sure. Yeah. But I think I screamed because I, I know I scared my husband. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> what is going on? But you know, I think just that whole lesson, I think there's a lesson there as well. Feeling the pain is actually a healthy thing. You know what I mean? I don't know. There's something when you said that, it just resonated with me that that's such a powerful lesson right there in itself. Yes, it is. Yeah. And when you move forward, uh, so let's say you were on, um, so you had a walker. And then mm-hmm. did you ever reflect in that moment of, well, however long it was prior to that, I couldn't even move my toes. So the progression of what that was like, were you able to have that juxtaposition between then versus now, I guess? Well, all I knew, I, yes. And all I knew is I was out of bed and I was 34 and on a walker. And at that time, I just remember thinking, I'm never going to be normal again. Oh my gosh, yeah. So it was like, yes, I'm out of bed. Yes, I'm walking. And 
well, crap, I'm never going to be normal again. I'm like my grandmother. I'm on a freaking mm. fire. <laughs> so, so it was a mixed blessing kind of moment, uh, or, you know, like several sure. months at least until I got my head around it. Each stage of this journey was like getting my head around. This is no, this is actually a good thing, sweetie. It's actually, I, I talked to myself like I was a three-year-old child because it's that three-year-old child of a piece of us mm -hmm. that's belling and that's mourning the loss of, you know, the former, you know, mobility or whatever. Yes, of course. It is. When you focus on the what instead of where it currently is, that radical acceptance, yes. Exactly, exactly. And it's, it, you, we have to be very gentle mm -hmm. and, and treat ourselves very, you know, oh, sweetie, it's okay. It's going to be all right. You know, you're going to see, because look, you couldn't do this a month ago. Yeah. It's that kind of thing. And I love to hear how compassionate you were because so many times we as an individual separate ourselves and we treat ourselves the way that we would never treat someone that we love. But yet we do that for ourselves. Our self-talk can sometimes be so negative or so, well, I guess just really negative overall. And so we don't allow for that self-compassion to really heal us, emotionally heal us, to help us move into that physical healness, that spiritual healing as well. Yes. And I, I've been through uh, two relationships, two very long-term marriages and divorces right now. And when I was going through my second divorce, there was a book I'd like to recommend sure. really helped me and an author, Sherry Huber, C-H-E-R-I-H-U-B-E-R. -E and it was called There's Nothing Wrong With You. Mm, I love it. And she's a Buddhist nun. Actually, she's the abbot of a monastery. In wow. Canada, a Zen monastery. And uh, the premise is that we are suffering, the entire world is suffering an epidemic of self-hatred. And we were not meant to live this way. And there's really, we're all afraid that we're going to be found out as a fraud or we're going to be found out for, you know, not being a good person. Mm -hmm. And we have been taught as children to, and it's nobody's fault. It's how our parents were raised and their parents were raised. Sure. But we're taught to be vigilant against any sign of, you know, not okayness and then beat down on ourselves furiously and severely. So that we never do that again. And has that worked? No. <laughs> so, so uh, no. I, I just at this, and I was getting those teachings. I was very fortunate to have a spiritual mentor at the time that was, you know, with me through my life from uh, teenage years. And Corliss Raymond Delarm Jr. was his name. People called him D, and he was a shaman, actually, oh, actual practicing medicine man wow. in Columbia, Missouri. And oh, wow. <laughs> he, told me, he told me the same thing. Yeah, I apprenticed to him for 15 years, wow. and um, he pretty much preached the same thing. And his his catchphrase was, you are love, you are loved, and you are loving. And I didn't understand that till I was 40. Mm. <laughs> so, but it took going through this, getting my mobility back to understand that, that I only was getting there through the grace of love, love of myself, love of my body, love of my efforts. Yes. You know, each effort, even though it wasn't immediately successful, is worthy and we are worthy just as we are and i think it goes back to you when you create a space that's benevolent that is that is endearing that is um full of compassion i mean that's that's really how things grow i mean you think about a garden if you're if you don't take care of your garden and you don't you know feed it or, or nurture it or love it it's never going to grow so it's the same type of thing when it comes to our own personal self and self self perception because if we don't nurture that there's no way it's going to grow. And so sometimes when we use that negative perception of, oh, what is wrong with you? Or what, what's, I can't believe you're like this or whatever that may be. And that really is kind of stomping on those flowers, if you will, if what that's, yeah. that's our life, you know? So that's something that we really have to be cognizant of, you know, think of it in that respect. That is exactly what it's like. And so I really like to hear how you kind of use that same perception or same um, self-talk as far as how love and what he taught you as well, because it's really, is so true in such a fundamental way. Well, I, when I was matriculating through graduate school, there were studies back in the 80s of plants that they would feed and water and give sunlight the exact same, but one group was told loving things and the other group was yelled at and shamed. And the, the group that was yelled at and shamed actually died. Oh my gosh, yeah. Getting, you know, getting the same exact nurturance uh, otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, the, water, the, sun, the sun, the water, and the food. So, and the, and the group that was told loving things bloomed. Mm -hmm. And that was brought home to us by uh, one of my professors. He said, this is not extraordinary. If you take a child, we were, we were studying um, the abusive childhood. 
at the time. Mm -hmm. If you take a child and put them in the same environment, that child will grow up to be uh, a criminal. And if you take a, a child and put them in a loving environment, that child will grow up to be a fully realized human being. So this is the same thing with us adults. We have a child inside, the inner child. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's heard of this by now. Yeah. We, that never goes away. Even though we're, you know, the body's grown up, that inner child is still there. And I think it's, it was a powerful, uh, you know, to recapitulate the whole idea of evolutionary environment mm -hmm. that I created for myself to say, what do you want to do today to my, to my inner child? How can I serve you and make your life happy? And to listen, truly deeply listen to this. It's the same. It's part of us, but it's a separate self within. And uh, the whole idea of schizophrenia changed in my mind or, or you know, multiple personalities mm -hmm. changed in sure. my mind. When I realized I don't just have an inner child within, I have a whole lot of different selves within. Yes, and <laughs> we they, do, we really do. If, everybody does, not just me, everybody. And if you're not, um, if you're doing things, thinking things, or saying things that are not in accordance with the happy heart of all of those selves, then your life doesn't work. Yes. So it's like, have a board meeting. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we do when it comes to dissociative identity disorder. But I, I totally understand what you're saying and obviously a very healthy way because we do have all those different senses of self. And I think that's one of the things I like to teach people as well is kind of with what you're saying, but if you, uh, to differentiate between the voice of that negative person or that voice of something different, which isn't my true voice. And so learning to discern yeah. the difference between what is not, I don't mean like literally a real voice, but in the sense of the, the, the impression of that, those thoughts or that randomness that comes into our life. We're like, wait a minute, what's that about? I mean, why am I even thinking that? James, what is going on? And that awareness to be like, wait a minute, that's not really true to who I am. So why am I thinking that? Let me change that. Let me change my self-talk. Let me change that awareness to say, no, that's, that's not really what I believe. Or if it is what I believe, I don't want to believe that anymore. So then we have to figure out, then what do we do then? Can I give you, can I give your audience a tool? Sure. For that? Um, one of the things that is very powerful it's been under study for quite some time now is the heart and the three brains in our body we have a brain in mm -hmm. our head brain in our heart and a brain in our gut yes we Stop, have yeah. brain tissue in the intestines so the heart math institute in boulder creek california very close to where i live in palo alto uh they've studied the heart and found out if you're in heart coherence in other words, if that board meeting happens and everybody goes, yeah, we're happy about this course of action, then you will have absolute success in your life. If you're trying to do something out of line with your, what your heart wants, then you're bound for failure. So the very simple tool that we can all use is to put one hand on the heart, one hand on the stomach, consider a course of action you know, uh, should I do this? Should I do that? A yes, no decision. And just ask the heart, how do you feel about it? And the, so the feeling of yes or true or go for it mm. is the same feeling that we get when we see a cute little puppy or kitten or a little baby that we love or the face of our beloved. That kind of that warm, fuzzy, you know, oh, yeah. it's, <laughs> that, that is a kind of, or some people describe it as, as champagne bubbles bubbling up in their heart. So that's a yes, true, or a go, go, go forth and do that thing. Oh, I love and it. That, so the, the hand on the gut is for, the, the gut is our kind of no brain. This is our BS detector. Mm -hmm. And you know that feeling when you are being lied to and you know that this person is lying to you and you just your whole body just pulls down and you're like oh no and it, you get this feeling this sick sad feeling in your stomach kind of a sour yeah. feeling that is the feeling of no don't do that don't go there and i've had uh, i've tuned my body su such that i can instantaneously know the answer without using the hands on and have been passing a dark alley that was a shortcut to my car, started to go down it, and my gut just clenched violently. Mm. I went, okay, no. Passed by it, then read in the, this was back in the day of newspapers, read in the newspaper the next morning that a murder had happened oh down that Oh my gosh, Miriam. 
Yeah. So the yeah. true sense but of trusting your gut is that's, really true. <laughs> gut, that's there's a reason for that phrase. Yeah. The thing is, the but your tongue will lie for chocolate cake. The gut and the heart will never lie. They're yeah. they're always true. So that's the, the voice of the true you exists in those two places, and it never will refuse to answer. It never will lie to you, and it's always present. So use it. Wow, Miriam, thank you so much. That's a wonderful, beautiful gift that I know my listeners are definitely going to start practicing on their own. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. If my listeners would like to find out more information about you and all the amazing things that you're doing, where would they find that information online? You can go to everywomanchanges, plural, changes.com, everywomanchanges.com. And if they go to everywomanchanges.com forward stroke inner biz, I-N-N-E-R-B-I-Z, they can get my ethos method that I developed to help me get over the paralysis and deal with problems in a twinkling. They can get that for free and it will show you how to, if you particularly if you run a business, how to use it for business, life, and relationships. Excellent. Well, once again, Marion, thank you so much for being a guest on my show today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, James. I appreciate it. I also want to thank you, my listener, for joining with me today. Please subscribe to this radio show through whichever portal you joined with me. Also, please go to my website where you may sign up for my newsletter, enroll in the Lifeology Academy, watch my YouTube episodes, and read all the articles I've written just for you. If you'd like to become a guest or advertise on my show, simply visit jamesmillerlifeology.com. You may also follow me on all social media platforms under the name James Miller Lifeology, except for Twitter, which is James M. Lifeology. Have a fantastic day, and I look forward to speaking with you very soon.